This is a reading from the novel The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan, Chapter 9. I am offered a quest. The next morning, Chiron moved me to Cabin 3. I didn't have to share with anybody. I had plenty of room for all my stuff. The Minotaur's horn, one set of spare clothes, and a toiletry bag. I got to sit at my own dinner table, pick all my own activities, call lights out whenever I felt like it, and not listen to anybody else. And I was absolutely miserable. Just when I'd started to feel accepted, to feel I had a home in Cabin 11 and I might be a normal kid, or as normal as you could be when you're a half-blood, I'd been separated out as if I had some rare disease. Nobody mentioned the Hellhound, but I got the feeling they were all talking about it behind my back. The attack had scared everybody. It sent two messages. One, that I was a son of the sea god, and two, monsters would stop at nothing to kill me. They could even invade a camp that had always been considered safe. The other camper steered clear of me as much as possible. Cabin 11 was too nervous to have sword class with me after what I'd done to the Ares folks in the woods, so my lessons with Luke became one-on-one. -on -one. He pushed me harder than ever and wasn't afraid to bruise me up in the process. You're gonna need to all the training you can get, he promised, as we were working with swords and flaming torches now let's try that viper's beheading strike again. Fifty more repetitions. Annabeth still taught me Greek in the mornings, but she seemed distracted. Every time I said something, she scowled at me, as if I'd just poked her between the eyes. After lessons, she would walk away muttering to herself, Quest, Poseidon, dirty, rotten, gotta make a plan. Even Clarice kept her distance though her venomous looks made it clear she wanted to kill me for breaking her magic spear. I wish you'd just yell or punch me or something. I'd rather get into fights every day than be ignored. I knew somebody at camp resented me, because one night I came into my cabin and found a mortal newspaper dropped inside the doorway, a copy of the New York Daily News, open to the Metro page. The article took me almost an hour to read because the angrier I got, the more the words floated around the page. Boy and mother still missing after freak car accident by Eileen Smith. Sally Jackson and son Percy are still missing one week after their mysterious disappearance. The family's badly burned 78 Camaro was discovered last Saturday on a North Long Island road with the roof ripped off and the front axle broken. The car had flipped and skidded for several hundred feet before exploding. Mother and son had gone for a weekend vacation to Montauk, but left hastily under mysterious circumstances. Small traces of blood were found in the car and near the scene of the wreck, but there are no other signs of the missing Jacksons. Residents in the rural area reported seeing nothing unusual around the time of the accident. Miss Jackson's husband, Gabe Bugliano, claims his stepson Percy Jackson is a troubled child who has been kicked out of numerous boarding schools and expressed violent tendencies in the past. Police would not say whether son Percy is a suspect in his mother's disappearance, but they have not ruled out foul play. Below are recent pictures of Sally Jackson and Percy. Police urge anyone with information to call the following toll-free Crime Stoppers hotline. The phone number was circled in black marker. I wadded up the paper and threw it away, then flopped down in my bunk bed in the middle of my empty cabin. Lights out, I told myself miserably. That night, I had the worst dream yet. I was running along the beach in a storm. This time, there was a city behind me, not New York. The sprawl was different, buildings spread out farther apart, palm trees and low hills in the distance. About a hundred yards down the surf, two men were fighting. They looked like TV wrestlers, muscular, with beards and long hair. Both wore flowing Greek tunics, one trimmed in blue, the other in green. They grappled with each other, wrestled, kicked, and headbutted, and every time they connected, lightning flashed, the sky grew darker, and the wind rose. I had to stop them. I didn't know why, but the harder I ran, the more the wind blew me back, until I was running in place, my heels digging uselessly in the sand. Over the roar of the storm, I could hear the blue robed one yelling at the green robed one, give it back, give it back, like a kindergartner fighting over a toy. The waves got bigger, crashing into the beach, spraying me with salt. I yelled, Stop it! Stop fighting! The ground shook. Laughter came somewhere underneath the earth, and a voice so deep and evil it turned my blood to ice. Come down, little hero, the voice crooned. Come down. 
The sand split beneath me, opening up a crevice straight down into the center of the earth. My feet slipped and the darkness swallowed me. I woke up, sure I was falling. I was still in bed in cabin three. My body told me it was morning, but it was dark outside, and thunder rolled across the hills. A storm was brewing. I hadn't dreamed that. I heard a clopping sound at the door, a hoof knocking on the threshold. Come in? Grover trotted inside, looking worried. Mr. D wants to see you. Why? He wants to kill... I mean, I better let him tell you. Nervously, I got dressed and followed, sure that I was in huge trouble. For days, I'd been half expecting a summons to the big house. Now that I was declared a son of Poseidon, one of the big three gods who weren't supposed to have kids, I figured it was a crime for me just to be alive. The other gods had probably been debating the best way to punish me for existing. And now, Mr. D was ready to deliver their verdict. Over Long Island Sound, the sky looked like ink soup coming to a boil. A hazy curtain of rain was coming in our direction. I asked Grover if we needed an umbrella. No, he said. It never rains here unless we want it to. I pointed at the storm. What the heck is that then? He glanced uneasily at the sky. It'll pass around us. Bad weather always does. I realized he was right. In the week I'd been here, it'd never been overcast. The few rain clouds I'd seen had skirted right around the edges of the valley. But this storm, this one was huge. At the volleyball pit, the kids from Apollo's cabin were playing a morning game against the satyrs. Dionysus' twins were walking around in the strawberry fields, making the plants grow. Everybody was going about their normal business, but they looked tense. They kept their eyes on the storm. Grover and I walked up to the front porch of the big house. Dionysus sat at the pinochle table in his tiger-striped Hawaiian shirt with his Diet Coke, just as he had on my first day. Chiron sat across the table in his fake wheelchair. They were playing against invisible opponents, two sets of cards hovering in the air. Wow, wow, Mr. D said without looking up. Our little celebrity. I waited. Come closer, Mr. D said. And don't expect me to coddle you, mortal, just because old Barnacle Beard is your father. A net of lightning flashed across the clouds. Thunder shook the windows of the house. Blah, blah, blah. Dionysus said. Chiron fiend interest in his pinochle cards. Grover cowered by the railing, his hooves clopping back and forth. If I had my way, Dionysus said, I would cause your molecules to erupt in flames. We'd sweep them up in ashes and be done with a whole lot of trouble. But Chiron seems to feel this will go against my mission as the cursed camp to keep your little brat safe from harm. Spontaneous combustion is a form of harm, Mr. D, Chiron put in. Nonsense, Dionysus said. Boy wouldn't feel a thing. Nevertheless, I've agreed to restrain myself. I'm thinking of turning you into a dolphin instead, sending you back to your father. Mr. D, Chiron warned. Oh, all right, Dionysus relented. There's one more option, but it's deadly in foolishness. Dionysus rose, and the invisible player's cards dropped to the table. I'm off to Olympus for the emergency mating. If the boy is still here when I get back, I'll turn him into an Atlantic bottlenose. Do you understand? And Perseus Jackson, if you're at all smart, you'll see that there's a much more sensible choice than the what Chiron feels you must do. Dionysus picked up a playing card, twisted it, and it became a plastic rectangle. A credit card? No, a security pass. He snapped his fingers. The air seemed to fold and bend around him. He became a hologram, then a wind, then he was gone, leaving only the smell of fresh-pressed grapes lingering behind. Chiron smiled at me, but he looked tired and strained. Sit, Percy, please, and Grover. We did. Chiron laid his cards on the table, a winning hand he hadn't gotten to use. Tell me, Percy, he said. What do you make of the Hellhound? Just hearing the name made me shudder. Chiron probably wanted me to say, Heck, it was nothing. I eat Hellhounds for breakfast. But I didn't feel like lying. It scared me, I said. If you hadn't shot it, I'd be dead. You'll meet me worse, Percy. Far worse. Before you're done. Done with what? Your quest, of course. Will you accept it? I glanced at Grover, who was crossing his fingers. Um, sir, I said, you haven't told me what it is yet. 
Kyron grimaced. Well, that's the hard part, the details. Thunder rumbled across the valley. The storm clouds had now reached the edge of the beach. As far as I could see, the sky and the sea were boiling together. Poseidon and Zeus, I said. They're fighting over something valuable, something that was stolen, aren't they? Chiron and Grover exchanged looks. Chiron sat forward in his wheelchair. How did you know that? My face felt hot. I wish I hadn't opened my big mouth. The weather since Christmas had been weird, like the sea and sky were fighting. Then I talked to Annabeth, and she overheard something about a theft, and also I've been having these dreams. I knew it, Grover said. Hush, Sata, Chiron ordered. But it is his quest. Grover's eyes were bright with excitement. It must be. Only the Oracle can determine. Chiron stroked his beard briskly. Nevertheless, Percy, you are correct. Your father and Zeus are having their worst quarrel in centuries. They are fighting over something valuable that has been stolen, to be precise, a lightning bolt. I laughed nervously. A what? Do not take this lightly, Chiron warned. I'm not talking about some tinfoil covered zigzag you'd see in a second grade play. I'm talking about a two foot long cylinder of high grade celestial bronze capped on both ends of the gods level explosives. Oh, Zeus's master bolt. Chiron said, getting worked up now. The symbol of his power, from which all other lightning bolts are patterned. The first weapon made by the Cyclops for the war against the Titans. The bolt that sheared the top of Mount Etna and hurtled Kronos from his throne. The master bolt which packs enough power to make mortal hydrogen bombs look like firecrackers. And it's missing. Stolen, Chiron said. By who? By whom? Chiron corrected, once a teacher, always a teacher. By you. My mouth fell open. At least, Chiron held up his hand. That's what Zeus thinks. During the winter solstice, all the last council of gods, Zeus and Poseidon, had an argument. The usual nonsense, Mother Rhea always liked you best, air disasters are more spectacular than sea disasters, etc. Afterward, Zeus realized his master bolt was missing taken from the throne room under his very nose. He immediately blamed Poseidon. Now, a god cannot upsurp another god's symbol of power directly that is forbidden by the ancient divine laws. But Zeus believes your father convinced a human, our hero, to take it. But I didn't. Patience and listen, child, Chiron said. Zeus has good reason to be suspicious. The forges of the Cyclops are under the ocean, which gives Poseidon some influence over the makers of his brother's lightning. Zeus believes Poseidon has taken the Master Bolt and is now secretly having the Cyclops build an arsenal of illegal copies, which might be used to topple Zeus from his throne. The only thing Zeus wasn't sure about was which hero Poseidon used to steal the Bolt. Now Poseidon has openly claimed you as his son. You were in New York over the winter holidays. You could easily have snuck into Olympus. Zeus believes he's found his thief. But I've never even been to Olympus. Zeus is crazy. Chiron and Grover glanced nervously at the sky. The clouds didn't seem to be parting around us, as Grover had promised. They were rolling straight over our valley, sealing us in like a coffin lid. Er, Percy, Grover said, we don't use the C word to describe the Lord of the Sky. Perhaps paranoid? Chiron suggested. Then again, Poseidon has tried to unseat Zeus before. I believe that was question 38 on your exam. He looked at me as if he exactly expected me to remember question 38. How could anyone accuse me of stealing a god's weapon? I couldn't even steal a slice of pizza from Gabe's poker party without getting busted. Chiron was waiting for an answer. Something about a golden net, I guess? Poseidon and Hera and a few other gods, they, like, trapped Zeus and wouldn't let him out until he promised to be a better ruler, right? Correct, Chiron said. And Zeus has never trusted Poseidon since. Of course, Poseidon denies stealing the Master Bolt. He took great offense at the accusation. The two have been arguing back and forth for months, threatening war. And now you have come along, the proverbial last straw. But I'm just a kid. Percy, Grover cut in, if you were Zeus and you already thought your brother was plotting to overthrow you, then your brother suddenly admitting to have broken a sacred oath 
he took after World War II, that he's fathered a new mortal hero who might be a use as a weapon against you, wouldn't that put a twist in your toga? But I didn't do anything. Poseidon, my dad, he didn't really have this master bolt stolen, did he? Chiron sighed. Most thinking observers would agree that thievery is not Poseidon's style. But the sea god is too proud to try convincing Zeus of that. Zeus has demanded that Poseidon return the bolt by the summer solstice. That's June 21st, ten days from now. Poseidon wants an apology for being called a thief by the same date. I hope that diplomacy might prevail, that Hera and Demeter and Hestia would make the two brothers see sense, but your arrival has inflamed Zeus's temper. Now neither god will back down, unless someone intervenes, unless the master bolt is found in return to Zeus before the solstice. There will be war. And do you know what a full-fledged war would look like, Percy? Bad, I guessed. Imagine the world in chaos, nature at war with itself, Olympians forced to choose a side between Zeus and Poseidon, destruction, carnage, millions dead, Western civilization turned into battleground, so big it will make the Trojan War look like a water balloon fight. Bad, I repeated. And you, Percy Jackson, would be the first to feel Zeus's wrath. It started to rain. Volleyball players stopped their game and stared stunned in silence at the sky. I had brought this storm to Half-Blood Hill. Zeus was punishing the whole camp because of me. I was furious. So I have to find the stupid bolt, I said, and return it to Zeus. What better peace offering, Chiron said, than to have the son of Poseidon return Zeus's property. If Poseidon doesn't have it, where is the thing? Oh, I believe I know. Chiron's expression was grim. Part of a prophecy I had years ago. Well, some of the lines make sense to me now. But before I can say more, you must officially take up your quest. You seek the counsel of the Oracle. Why can't you just tell me where the bolt is beforehand? Because if I did, you'd be too afraid to accept the challenge. I swallowed. Good reason. You agree, then? I looked at Grover, who nodded encouragingly. Easy for him. I was the one Zeus wanted to kill. All right, I said. It's better than being turned into a dolphin. Then it is time you consulted the Oracle, Chiron said. Go upstairs, Percy Jackson, to the attic. When you come back down, assuming you're still sane, we will talk more. Four flights upstairs ended under a green trap door. I pulled the cord. The door swung down and a wooden ladder clattered into place. The warm air from above smelled like mildew and rotten wood and something else, a smell I remembered from biology class, reptiles, the smell of snakes. I held my breath and climbed. The attic was filled with Greek hero junk, armor stands covered in cobwebs, once bright shields pitted with rust, old leather streamer trunks plastered with stickers saying Ithaca, Circe Isles, and Land of the Amazons, one long table was stacked with glass jars filled with pickled things, severed hairy claws, huge yellow eyes, various other parts of monsters. A dusty mounted trophy on the wall looked like a giant snake head, but with horns and a full set of shark's teeth. The plaque read, Hydra Head No. 1, Woodstock, New York, 1969. By the window, sitting on a wooden tripod stool, was the most gruesome memento of all, a mummy. Not the wrapped in cloth kind, but a human female body shriveled to a husk. She wore a tie-dyed sundress, lots of beaded necklaces, and a headband over her long black hair. The skin of her face was thin and leathery over her skull, and her eyes were glassy white slits, as if the real eyes had been replaced by marbles. She'd been dead a long, long time. Looking at her sent chills up my back, and that was before she sat up on her stool and opened her mouth. A green mist poured from the mummy's mouth, coiling over the floor in thick trend tendrils, hissing like 20,000 snakes. I stumbled over myself trying to get the trap door, but it slammed shut. Inside my head, I heard a voice slithering into one ear and coiling around my brain. I am the spirit of Delphi, speaker of the prophecies of Phoebus. Apollo, slayer of the mighty Python, 
approach seeker and ask. I wanted to say, no thanks, wrong door, just looking for the bathroom, but I forced myself to take a deep breath. The mummy wasn't alive. She was some kind of gruesome receptacle for something else. The power that was now swirling around me in the green mist, but its presence didn't feel evil, like the demonic math teacher Mrs. Dodds or the Minotaur. It felt more like the three fates I'd seen knitting than yarn outside the highway fruit stand. Ancient, powerful, and definitely not human, but not particularly interested in killing me either. I got up the courage to ask, what is my destiny? The mist swirled more thickly, collecting right in front of me and around the table with pickled monster part jars. Suddenly, there were four men sitting around the table playing cards. Their faces became clearer. It was smelly Gabe and his buddies. My fists clenched. Though I knew this poker party couldn't be real, it was an illusion made out of mist. Gabe turned toward me and spoke in the raspy voice of the oracle. You shall go west and face the god who has turned. His buddy on the right looked up and said the same in the same voice. You shall find what was stolen and see it safely returned. The guy on the left threw in two poker chips and said, You shall be betrayed by the one who calls you a friend. Finally, Eddie, our building super, delivered the worst line of all. And you shall fail to save what matters the most in the end. The figures began to dissolve. At first, I was too stunned to say anything. But as the mist retreated, coiling into the huge green serpent like slithering back into the mouth of the mummy, I cried, Wait, what do you mean? What friend? What will I fail to save? The tail of the mist snake disappeared into the mummy's mouth. She reclined back against the wall, her mouth closed tight, as if it hadn't been opened in a hundred years. The attic was silent again, abandoned, nothing but a room full of mementos. I got the feeling I could stand here until I had cobwebs too, and I wouldn't learn anything else. My audience with the oracle was over. Well, Chiron asked me. I slumped into a chair at the pinochle table. She said I would retrieve what was stolen. Grover sat forward, chewing excitedly on the remains of a Diet Coke can. That's great. What did the oracle say exactly? Chiron pressed. This is important. My ears were still tingling from the Italian voice. She, she said I would go west and face the god who had turned. I'd retrieve what was stolen and see it safely returned. I knew it, Grover said. Chiron didn't look satisfied. Anything else? I didn't want to tell him. What friend would betray me? I didn't have that many. In the last line, I would fail to save what mattered most. What kind of oracle would send me on a quest and said, tell me, Oh, by the way, you'll fail. How could I confess that? No, I said, that's about it. He studied my face. Very well, Percy. But know this. The oracle's words often have double meanings. Don't dwell on them too much. The truth is not always clear until events come to pass. I got the feeling he knew I was holding back something bad, and he was trying to make me feel better. Okay, I said anxious to change the topics. So where do I go? Who's the god in the west? Ah, think, Percy, Chiron said. If Zeus and Poseidon weaken each other in the war, who stands to gain? Somebody else who wants to take over, I guess. Yes, quite. Someone who harbors a grudge, who has been unhappy with his lot since the world was divided eons ago, whose kingdom would grow powerful with the deaths of millions. Someone who hates his brothers for forcing him into an oath to have no more children, an oath that both of them have now broken. I thought about my dreams, the evil voice I'd spoken from under the ground. Hades, Kyra nodded. The Lord of the Dead is the only possibility. A scrap of aluminum dribbled out of Grover's mouth. Whoa, wait, what? what? A fury came after Percy, Chiron reminded him. She watched the young man until she was sure of his identity, then tried to kill him. Furies obey only one Lord, Hades. Yes, but Hades hates all heroes, Grover protested. Especially if he's found out Percy is the son of Poseidon. A hellhound got into the forest, Chiron continued. 
Those can only be summoned from the fields of punishment, and it has been summoned by one within the camp. Hades must have spy here. He must suspect Poseidon will try to use Percy to clear his name. Hades would very much like to kill this young half-blood before he can take on the quest. Great, I muttered. That's two major gods who want me to kill me. But a quest, too, Grover swallowed. I mean, couldn't the Master Bolt be in some place like Maine? Maine's very nice this time of year. Hades sent a minion to steal the Master Bolt, Chiron insisted. He hid it in the underworld, knowing full well that Zeus would blame Poseidon. Oh, I don't pretend to understand the Lord of the Dead's motives perfectly, or why he chose this time to start a war. But one thing is certain, Percy must go to the underworld, find the Master Bolt, and reveal the truth. A strange fire burned in my stomach. The weirdest thing was, it wasn't fear, it was anticipation. The desire for revenge. Hades had tried to kill me three times so far, with the Fury, the Minotaur, and the Hellhound. It was his fault my mother had disappeared in a flash of light. Now, he was trying to frame me and my dad for a theft we hadn't committed. I was ready to take him on. Besides, if my mother was in the underworld... Whoa, boy, said a small part of my brain that was still sane. You're a kid. Hades is a god. Grover was trembling. He started eating pinochle cards like potato chips. The poor guy needed to complete a quest with me to, so he could get his searcher's license, whatever that was. But how could I ask him to do this quest, especially when the oracle said I was destined to fail? This was suicide. Look, if we know it's Hades, I told Chiron, why can't we just tell the other gods? Zeus or Poseidon could go down to the underworld and bust some heads. Suspecting and knowing are not the same, Chiron said. Besides, even if the other gods suspect Hades, and I imagine Poseidon does, they couldn't retrieve the bolt themselves. Gods cannot cross each other's territories except by invitation. That is another ancient rule. Heroes, on the other hand, have certain privileges. They can go anywhere, challenge anyone, as long as they're bold enough and strong enough to do it. No god can be held responsible for a hero's actions. Why do you think gods always operate through humans? You're saying I'm being used. I'm saying it's no accident Poseidon has claimed you now. It's a very risky gamble. But he is in desperate situation. He needs you. My dad needs me. Emotions rolled around inside me like bits of glass in a kaleidoscope. I didn't know whether to feel resentful or grateful or happy or angry. Poseidon had ignored me for 12 years. Now suddenly he needed me? I looked at Chiron. You've known I was Poseidon's son all along, haven't you? Well, I had my suspicions. As I said, I've spoken to the Oracle too. I got the feeling there was a lot he wasn't telling me about his prophecy, but I decided I couldn't worry about that right now. After all, I was holding back information too. So let me get this straight, I said. I'm supposed to go to the underworld and confront the Lord of the Dead. Check, Chiron said. Find the most powerful weapon in the universe. Check. And get it back to Olympus before the summer solstice in 10 days. That's about right. I looked at Grover, who gulped down the Ace of Hearts. Did I mention that Maine is very nice this time of year? He asked weakly. You don't have to go, I told him. I can't ask that of you. Oh, he shifted his hooves. No, it's just that satyrs and underground places, well... He took a deep breath, then stood, brushing the shredded cards and aluminum bits off his t-shirt. You saved my life, Percy. If, if you're serious about wanting me along, I won't let you down. I felt so relieved I wanted to cry though I didn't think that would be very heroic. Grover was the only friend I'd ever had for longer than a few months. I wasn't sure what good a satyr could do against the forces of the dead, but I felt better knowing he'd be with me. All the way, G-Man. I turned to Chiron. So, where do we go? The Oracle just said go west. The entrance to the underworld is always in the west. It moves from age to age, just like Olympus. Right now, of course, it's in America. Where? Chiron looked surprised. I thought that would be obvious enough. The entrance to the underworld is in Los Angeles. Oh, I said. Naturally. So we just get on a plane? No, Grover shrieked. Percy, what are you thinking? Have you ever been on a plane in your life? 
I shook my head, feeling embarrassed. My mom had never taken me anywhere by plane. She'd always said we didn't have the money. Besides, her parents had died in a plane crash. Percy, think, Chiron said. You are the son of the sea god. Your father's bitterest rival is Zeus, lord of the sky. Your mother knew better than to trust you in an airplane. You would be in Zeus's domain. You would never come down again alive. Overhead, lightning crackled, thunder boomed. Okay, I said, determined not to look at the storm. So I'll travel over land. That's right, Chiron said. Two companions may accompany you. Grover is one. The other has already volunteered if you accept her help. Gee, I said, feeling surprised. Who else would be stupid enough to volunteer for a quest like this? The air shimmered behind Chiron. Annabeth became visible, stuffing her Yankees cap into her back pocket. I've been waiting a long time for a quest, seaweed brain, she said. Athena is no fan of Poseidon, but if you're going to save the world, I'm the best person to keep you from messing up. If you do say so yourself, I said. I suppose you have a plan, wise girl? Her cheeks colored. Do you want my help or not? The truth was I did. I needed all the help I could get. A trio, I said. That'll work. Excellent, Chiron said. This afternoon, we can take you as far as the bus terminal in Manhattan. After that, you are on your own. Lightning flashed. Rain poured down on the meadows that were never supposed to have violent weather. No time to waste, Chiron said. I think you should all get packing. That was Chapter 9 from the book The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan.